happens. All right, so I think we are live, so I will kick off the intro. All right, uh, hello everybody and, and welcome back to uh, this week's uh, micro seminar. Um, so it's, it's postponed from last week because I had a bit of a technical glitch, uh, but we've re re resolved that. So hopefully we are all good to go now and there hopefully should be any, uh, any other technical issues that arise today, hopefully, we'll see. Um, so I want to uh, give a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Zaki Z Sabri. Um, he is a associate professor at Ohio State, I should say, the Ohio State University. Um, <laughs> Zaki started as a undergrad at Howard University um, and then kind of for graduate school and postdoctoral uh, fellowships went to some really awesome labs. So he was a graduate student at Wisconsin with Joe Handelsman um, and then went and did a postdoc with Nancy Moran, both at the University of Arizona here in Tucson for a few years um, and then went with her to uh, Yale as she moved up to Yale. Um, after that postdoc, uh, he started his own lab at, again, the Ohio State University. I've, I have to say that because my sister went there too. So they, they really burned it into me to, to say that. Um, so he started his lab at uh, the Ohio State University um, and a couple years ago was promoted to associate professor where he is working on microbiome research in a couple different model systems. And so um, I think Zaki, uh, Zaki and I met at a, a GRC a while ago, um, uh, Microbial Populations GRC. Um, but I also just want to give a shout out to uh, uh, Kelly Wrighton because Kelly, uh, we were, we were at, for ASM Microbe last year, we were poking around ideas for who might be able to come and give a good talk on microbiome stuff. Um, and Kelly was at Ohio State and she said, oh, Zaki would be great to come and give a talk. And so we tried to get him scheduled to, to give a talk at ASM Microbe last year. And then you all know what happened with conferences last year. Um, so I'm, I'm really happy to, to be able to give him the chance today to, to share his work um, here in micro seminar. So uh, with that, I'm gonna give it over to Zaki and I will, uh, I will take off my video. So take it away, Zaki. All right, great, thanks. Um, yeah, so thank you, David, for the opportunity to uh, share my work. Um, hopefully you can hear me pretty well. Um, this is probably the weirdest way of giving a talk that I've experienced thus far. I feel like I'm like on a space station someplace. Um, but anyway, uh, I'm really excited to do this and hopefully, um, Everyone uh, who has any questions, if you don't have a chance to be able to post them now, um, my email address is there on the front page in red um, right here. And so if um, you have any questions, don't hesitate to just, um, you know, go ahead and give me a, uh, shoot me an email or something, and I'm happy to respond to that. All right, so I'll be talking a little bit today about uh, some of the work that we've been doing in the lab for the last few years. Um, and so uh, the title of my talk is Modeling How Gut Microbes Are Integral to Normal Host Growth and Development. So our lab um, here at Ohio State, um, it's called the Insect Microbial Symbiosis Lab. Um, and we're primarily interested in symbioses. And so we define this rather broadly as persistent interspecies interactions. Um, and because we're in a evolutionary biology department and my brain is firmly in an evolutionary biology department, um, we're really interested in uncovering and demonstrating the evidence for these interactions. And this evidence can uh, be everything from looking at you know, gene expression to actual sort of uh, physical um, components of cells um, and Anything else is interacting or being shared between organisms um, and being able to show that um, the material stuff that underlies um, what consti uh, constitutes a symbiotic interaction. And so we, again, like I said, define it rather generally. And so we're interested not just in your sort of, you know, typical mutualism, say like between Buchnera and aphids, um, but we're also interested in um, pathogenic interactions, and then, you know, sort of relationships like commensals and, you know, trying to understand what are the, what's the nature of all these. And so 
you know, one benefit of maintaining this kind of broad interest in all of these forms of symbiosis is that it gives me access to uh, different types of platforms um, from looking at sort of disease models as well as to looking at um, kind of beneficial interactions as well. And so we work primarily with and in insects. And the reason why um, I say that is because um, insects have been here for quite some time. They're some of the oldest and most diverse microbial organisms on our planet. Um, and part of their ability to be so successful uh, on our planet, we think is in part due to uh, the development of relationships with microbes. We think that microbes have allowed them to be able to uh, acquire uh, various features and functions that to evolve them de novo uh, would be highly unlikely. And so the acquisition of these relationships um, potentially allows them to explore evolutionary space more quickly. Um, and so we're interested in being able to uh, exploit uh, this biodiversity um, as a way to understand not only how these relationships are working, but how broad they are um, and looking for commonalities across different types of, uh, of, of insect families. And so some of the uh, types of you know, mutualisms that exist between microbes and insects that I think many of you are um, familiar with would be those between say termites and their gut bacteria um, and how they enable uh, termites to be able to persist and thrive um, on hardwoods and softwoods and dampwoods and such. Um, but also another example would be uh, in aphids, which uh, maintain mutualisms with Buchnera, which is responsible for uh, provisioning uh, essential uh, um, amino acids and vitamins to uh, the host. Um, in exchange for um, carbohydrates. And then also they maintain protective um, facultative symbionts that um, essentially can protect them from parasitic loss. And so um, defense from pathogens um, as well as diet accessibility are pretty common themes across insect microbial interactions. Okay, so uh, in our lab, we have studied uh, kind of two major types of interactions, uh, host microbial interactions. Um, we've looked at uh, obligate endosymbiont interactions with their hosts. Um, and then and this is where you have like maybe one or two uh, bacteria that live uh, oftentimes solely within the tissues of their host. Um, but then we also are interested in gut host gut microbiome host interactions as well. And so these can, you know, be a few to uh, several uh, different species living within uh, the gut cavities um, and on uh, gut tissues um, in their host. And many of them can be acquired from the environment. They can be uh, transmitted vertically uh, through generations. They can also be transmitted between nestmates and between individuals, so horizontally. So these many modes of, trans, of uh, transmission um, can sort of impose some very interesting, um, uh, uh, can lead to some very interesting evolutionary outcomes um, and can potentially lead to some very interesting uh, relationships, be it very you know, tight um, relationships or even kind of transient ones. And so host microbes have become, um, host gut microbiomes have become really interesting, of a, a lot of interest in the last uh, sort of decade or so um, with, you know, acknowledgement that gut bacteria can play a role in um, nutrient provisioning, uh, the breakdown of plant-based diets. They can play a role in uh, development, um, like I said, pathogen defense earlier. Uh, they can be directly digested and they can also play a role in detoxifying uh, components of a diet as well. And so we have over here examples of various different types of animals um, and their, uh, the 
sort of the physiological structure of their guts and where we find their, uh, their gut microbiomes. And we think that the digestive tract is, you know, in some ways is wonderful meeting place for the external environment and all the conditions uh, that exist there um, with the internal environment. And so, you know, what are the, say, the physiological, the nutritional and developmental needs of the host? And microbes are right at that nexus. And they're playing a role in not only helping to sort of communicate what is going on outside, um, in the outside by helping to sort of digest various things that are, uh, um, or break down various things that are ingested by the host, um, but then they can also signal to the host um, in some ways uh, their own needs. And so being able to study how microbes are impacting their host um, and vice versa is of great interest um, as we're beginning to sort of understand their role in all of these different functions. And so to be able to study these um, a major tool that has become popular are the use of germ-free organisms. And so germ-free rodents has been um, a organism that has been recognized as being quite useful um, for over the last, for the last over 50 years or so, um, because it allows for us to be able to ask questions about how microbes may play a role um, in the lives of vertebrates. Um, and obviously we're very interested in vertebrates being vertebrates ourselves, most of us at least. Um, and so having uh, tools that would allow us to be able to introduce in a deterministic way um, microbes that might typically be found within vertebrates and then looking at sort of phenotypic outcomes can be very important. And so, a, um, and so that introduction of, of uh, bacteria into germ-free organisms, or in this case, germ-free mice, um, we would describe as being a uh, notobiosis. Um, and so we have here some examples of essentially how germ-free uh, rodents are made. And as you can see, it's, it's quite a labor intensive um, and a sort of infrastructure intensive process. And sadly, there, there can be a lot of loss of, of, um, of individuals in the process of making them. And so in some ways to respond to the expense of having or of, of, of trying to re rear and maintain germ-free rodents, the development of uh, germ-free organisms um, that maybe don't have the same kind of uh, constraints, be it in terms of infrastructure, cost, specialized labor, um, as well as the various policies and, uh, and licensure that's required for working with vertebrates uh, has become popular. And so one of these uh, organisms or insects are a really great platform um, for developing germ-free animals uh, as experimental platforms. And so a major germ-free invertebrate would be uh, fruit flies uh, and Drosophila in this case. And so Drosophila are highly amenable um, for making, uh, for rendering them as germ-free. Uh, because they have, not only are they easy to rear, um, but there's abundant genomic, genetic, um, and genetic tools already available. Um, and so being able to essentially set up a, um, a germ-free Drosophila um, platform in one's lab doesn't require nearly the, uh, the, the level of demanding technical um, and specialized uh, equipment and such uh, that one would need for uh, working with vertebrates. Um, and you can still ask a lot of the same questions. Okay, so um, in some ways, there's, there's several other advantages of working with um, invertebrates like Drosophila um, versus working with uh, uh, mice. So like they can have, they have a pretty short lifespan. You can get a lot of individuals and a fairly short um, sort of, you know, enclosure or very small enclosure. Uh, the husbandry is really easy. There's certainly genomic resources, not that there, there are also genomic resources for uh, rodents as well. Um, but there's a significant cost difference between uh, sort of germ-free mice and then germ-free insects. And so here we could say it's about um, a 
you know, germ-free mice can be about 300 bucks or more. Um, and germ-free insects can be, you know, by our math, about a dollar each, which I think is actually on the high end probably for Drosophila. So they can be really affordable, convenient, um, and high throughput. Um, some disadvantages or, ma you know, major disadvantage of working with um, some invertebrates like Drosophila is that you can have potentially different uh, gut anatomy and then the gut microbiomes may not necessarily be uh, as similar um, between them. And so when we actually look at the breakdown um, of the gut, micro gut microbial compositions between say Drosophila, mice and humans, um, we can see some notable differences in, 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 uh, between the, uh, the mammals and Drosophila, namely the absence of um, some major groups like the Bacteroidetes um, and the Actinos. Um, and so, you know, in some ways there's been some search for, um, you know, an appropriate invertebrate that might have gut, a gut microflora that is more similar to what we see in mammals. And so our lab did some work, um, or I did some work um, uh, back in 2014, published in 2014, and characterizing uh, the gut microbial community um, of Paraplanata americana. Um, this is the American, so-called American cockroach. Um, it uh, didn't originate here, uh, but this is where you certainly find it, um, and it has you know, lots of um, sort of uh, congenerics in other countries as well. But anyway, uh, we characterized it and found that it had a microbial community that was abundant in members of the Bacteroidetes and Firmicutes, um, as well as other taxa. Um, and it was pretty diverse in terms of the num numbers of, uh, of um, operational taxonomic units that we characterized. And so when we, sort of look at that relative to say mice and, and humans, we start seeing something a bit more similar in terms of the overall uh, microbial diversity uh, within um, cockroaches compared to humans and mice. We see some similarities there. And we think that's in part due to uh, the similar kinds of diets that uh, cockroaches have. They're, they're omnivorous, certainly paraphernalia um, and many other pest cockroaches. Uh, much to our dismay, um, are omnivorous. And so uh, similarly, um, humans are and some mice. And so it allows us to be, able, we, we think that that's probably driving some of that similarity that exists. And so in contrast, um, the gut microbial communities in Drosophila um, is quite, is in many ways distinct from what you would see in humans. Um, and, and, and in Paraplanate Americana. So this is why we think that in some ways, uh, cockroaches can be a really nice additional model system um, for asking questions that are relevant to uh, the function of the gut microbiomes um, in their host and looking at parallels between that and what we you know, would see maybe in humans. And we can use it as, a, we think, a really nice model uh, for asking questions that we cannot ask maybe in, in vertebrates easily. So in some, so as a part of looking at this sort of diversity here, we wanted to see whether or not we could actually start cultivating uh, some of these taxa and we were uh, successful um, in cultivating um, nearly a hundred uh, new, a uh, hundred new taxa um, from Paraplanata americana. Um, and a postdoc in my lab, um, Arturo, uh, recently published a paper on some of the members of the Bacteroidetes. And so um, we essentially sequenced the genomes of some of the more abundant uh, isolates that we have um, and uh, looked at the, uh, the polysaccharolytic um, capabilities of these taxa. Um, and we did that in part because Members of the Bacteroidetes are known um, for their, you know, effective abilities to, you know, break down a variety of different types of complex carbohydrates, um, and we know that many of them can be uh, quite abundant and contribute abundant in animal guts and contribute to 
um, the degradation of uh, plant diets. And so uh, we characterized several of these isolates um, genomically, and we found that many of them were capable of, of contributing to the degradation of uh, cellulose, um, as well as um, rabino, uh, arabinins and galactins um, and the like. And so these complex carbohydrates, which can be uh, pretty common in plant diets, uh, many of these bacteria um, can uh, produce enzymes that would allow for debranching and degradation um, of these. And so detecting these within Paraplate Americana um, suggests that uh, they could potentially be contributing to um, the breakdown of the host diet. And uh, cockroaches do feed on lots of de decaying, um, dead and decaying plant material. And so it's not um, unlikely that they would be uh, contributing to that. And so not only could we characterize them from a, geno a genomic point of view, but by having these cultured isolates in place, we could uh, characterize them uh, on media that contains uh, some of these uh, complex carbohydrates as the sole carbon source. And we were able to find that um, several of them were capable um, of being able to uh, uh, break down various uh, uh, carbohydrates. And so what is nice about this is that the, geno the genomic information um, informed us about uh, what they could actually do functionally and that we could uh, test this in the lab. And um, we also have here, uh, while well, we haven't published on this just yet, but um, some of the permicutes that we cultivated as well and found that um, two of them that we characterized were able to uh, break down pectin. And so that's a, a part of a forthcoming uh, manuscript. And so now that we were able to identify some of these bacteria uh, that are present within the gut, we were also interested in seeing whether or not we could reintroduce them into paraplane Americana and look at what impacts they could potentially have um, on the growth and development of the insect. And so to do this, uh, we developed a, a, a methodology for generating germ-free cockroaches. Um, and so um, a former graduate student who just graduated, uh, Benjamin Johns, um, essentially developed a really nice method over several years um, to be able to generate germ-free cockroaches without using any antibiotics, um, which is really nice because it means that you don't have to worry about um, just the diminished microbial uh, uh, gut microbial community, but actually having completely germ-free, which we've been able to um, uh, quality control for and, um, and ensure by a variety of different approaches. And we are currently able to get our individuals to survive into late in stars. And so what's nice about this is we can uh, conventionalize our germ-free by just feeding them uh, nestmate feces, uh, which they actually do anyway as a part of acquiring the gut microflora um, when they emerge from egg cases. Um, and we can also just co-house them, uh, which also allows them to be able to sort of um, have a wild type cockroach experience. Um, and then while it's not uh, imaged here, we can also just introduce uh, bacteria um, through using capillary tubes uh, and isolating them within our um, isolating chambers. Okay, so one thing that we did is we looked at what happens if you uh, conventionalize. So we wanted to just see if we conventionalize our germ-free cockroaches, what kinds of phenotypes would we, would we observe? Um, when we compared conventionalized, wild type, and just germ-free uh, insects. And so again, being able to do that would then allow us to look at a variety of different um, you know, phenotypes from a sort of a cellular level, developmental level, um, as well as at a, uh, a gene expression level. Okay, so um, this is what a typical wild type or conventionalized digestive system looks like. So this gut comes from an insect um, that, has, um, that hasn't eaten in a while. We actually uh, uh, allow them to sort of purge their guts a little bit um, before we dissected these out. Um, but this is just to show you that, you know, you can have basically sort of uh, pretty structured 
digestive system in the sense that you have, this is a, a clear mid gut and ileum and then a hind gut here. Um, and the brown is just a little bit of diet that's left in there. Um, and so essentially our, uh, our uh, conventionalized um, and conventionalized by co-housing um, and wild type uh, insects are virtually indistinguishable in terms of their digestive tracts. But when we compare them to our germ-free, we do find that um, there's quite stark differences. So our germ-free uh, digestive tracts or digestive tracts from our germ-free insects tend to be a um, lot less structured, more translucent, a lot less, what appears to be more flaccid. Um, they're sort of shorter in length. And so these kind of rather gross physiological, um, this gross physiological characteristics um, led us to want to delve a little bit deeper into seeing, you know, what's the nature of why uh, rearing them germ-free results in such a very distinct phenotype um, in the host. And so when we looked at also just the developmental time of our germ-free versus our conventionalized um, insects, we find in general that removal of the gut microflora and allowing them to, uh, to be reared um, germ-free through many of the instars, we find that our germ-free insects take um, longer, um, and in many cases, significantly longer period of time to uh, develop through each of their instars, uh, which accumulates into overall a longer developmental period. We also find that as as I stated previously, the lengths of the digestive tracts uh, tend to be a lot shorter um, in our germ-free insects versus um, in our uh, conventionalized and wild type. And we did, we did see that to be the case um, as well in which uh, germ-free insects had reduced mid-gut and hindgut uh, lengths relative to um, uh, conventionalized and wild type. And so again, this was just laying the groundwork for understanding sort of how the gut microflora, um, their absence can lead to developmental and growth issues um, in, our, uh, in our insects. Okay, so we wanted to also kind of drill down a little bit into what's happening, um, not just simply at the, um, uh, between the mid gut and the hind gut, but actually sort of breaking down the, the, these two major compartments into um, sort of subcompartments. Similar work has been done in Drosophila and has been shown that there is some structuring along the length of the mid guts and the hind guts in which you have different types of gene expression um, between say the anterior and posterior mid guts. So this would be anterior mid gut, posterior mid gut, and then the anterior, anterior hind gut, and posterior hind gut. And so we wanted to uh, look at that resolution as well within cockroaches and see whether or not we have sort of different kinds of development um, occurring um, at, uh, in those tissues. And so what we did is, and when I say we, the royal we, I mean my graduate student and a couple of undergrads, um, essentially did tons of thin sectioning of these tissues um, from uh, cockroaches from three treatment groups, so germ-free, conventionalized, um, and wild type. And so essentially it was, uh, you know, four subcompartments, five randomly sub selected fields of view from 15 thin sections from seven age max fifth instars, which in itself isn't um, trivial and getting age max, which equals them looking at a ton of, a ton of slides to be able to get these data. So again, I just think it's worth thanking my grad student for putting in all that hard work. And so, <clears throat> what we found from doing this high resolution histological um, analysis of these four subcompartments, and we looked at sort of a couple of different parts of, uh, of these thin sections. So we looked at visceral muscle tissue, which is just sort of surrounding uh, the gut. Uh, we looked at just the perimeter, sort of the length, so the thickness of that muscle tissue, uh, the perimeter around uh, the gut itself, also the perimeter of the, uh, the gut lumen, which includes those crypts, which, increase, which, allow, which allows for increased surface area. 
Um, and then finally, just looking at the total surface area of the gut as well. So that includes um, all of the viscera uh, that uh, comprises the gut. And so what we typically found was that the, um, the anterior hindgut and the posterior midguts, we saw the greatest impacts of the presence and absence of bacteria. Um, whereas in the anterior uh, midgut, that was not quite the same, although we, we did see some trends in terms of the presence and absence of bacteria. So the red would be germ-free, uh, blue, this is conventionalized, and then green would be our wild type. And so we see in general that uh, for, as we start looking at these particular thin sections or these treatments, um, in all of these different uh, subcompartments, we start seeing how the presence and absence of bacteria uh, can have um, significant impacts on the development of these tissues, okay? And so not only do we see that there's a distinct difference between wild type and germ-free, but also we see that conventionalization was able to recover um, in some cases near um, wild type or um, uh, similarities in uh, uh, the structure of those tissues that were indistinguishable from wild type, but that wasn't always the case. And we think that's in part due to the way in which we did uh, the conventionalization process and we're exploring um, sort of several different ways to do conventionalization as a part of a, uh, a follow-up study. Okay, so we've now looked at what happens when you just return potentially all the gut bacteria to um, germ-free insects by way of uh, providing them with grass um, from nest mates or co and co-housing them. We wanted to see what would happen if you just returned a subset of bacteria to uh, germ-free insects and looking at um, whether or not they would be capable of recovering um, wild type levels of development and, um, and morphology. And this is in part also inspired by work that's been done in Drosophila where it's been shown that you could reintroduce one or two bacteria uh, uh, commensals um, of the uh, of Drosophila and you're able to recover near wild type um, development. And so we wanted to see if the same was the case if we just took some of the commensals that we had in our, um, in our culture collection um, and you know, did sort of the same study. So what, happened, what we did find is that when we reintroduced uh, those isolates, so this, in this case, we were working with um, 11 bacteroides and, and two formicutes, so for a total of 13 isolates um, that were uh, reintroduced as sort of like a synthetic microbial community. We found that um, they were not actually able to recover the wild type phenotype. And so this is just sort of some exemplars of wild type um, fifth end stars and then um, notobiotic and germ free fifth end stars. And we see that the body sizes um, between the germ free and the notobiotic are uh, about the same, and they're both smaller than the wild type. We also found that um, the instar period, so the time um, in proceeding through different instars, uh, was also uh, longer for germ-free and our notobiotic, um, and both um, uh, were uh, indistinguishable from one another, but definitely slower than the wild type. We saw also um, significant differences between um, wild type and these the germ-free and notobiotic treatments. Um, and body sizes and body lengths as well. So all of these suggest that essentially just providing these, uh, these taxa were not capable of being able to recover um, wild type level development. And so when we actually then took these same individuals and, and looked at sort of the uh, transcriptional signals uh, from them as well, <clears throat> we were interested in seeing what does it look like? What's the transcriptional landscape for our germ-free Notobiotic in our in our wild type uh, individuals as well, and so one of the first things that popped out when we looked at uh, these uh, our samples <clears throat> from these treatments, and just note that we divided our uh, our tissue samples by uh, by gut region, so hindgut and midgut, um, and then 
so that would allow us to, to distinguish between th those two distinct functions um so or sort of groups of functions as it were um between the hind guts and the mid guts and then looking at how the treatments also broke out we did find that in general um what explained most of the differences between gene expression uh patterns uh was the gut regions um in which the samples were derived from uh, that was the prime that explained the primary bit of variation and then the second part of variation uh, was explained by um, the actual treatments themselves. And so that was, you know, sort of what we expected and was good to see. And so to circle back to uh, the carbohydrate issue, for example, one thing that we found was that uh, with our, when we compared our germ-free um, and our wild-type individuals, so uh, when we looked at genes involved in carbohydrate degradation, uh, what we found is that germ-free individuals, it appeared that they were, they upreg there was an upregulation of, uh, of, um, of starch um, de uh, degradatory, uh, degradative enzymes um, in sort of in these tissues relative to uh, wild type. And we think that's in part due to the fact that there was an absence of bacteria there that are likely uh, competing or participating um, in the breakdown of these uh, of these dietary components. Um, and when we actually look at when we compare germ-free to notobiotic as well, we saw kind of a similar profile. But what was really kind of interesting was that when we compared notobiotic and wild type, they were pretty much indistinguishable from one another. So what that suggested was that the return of many of the taxa that we introduced um, were able to sort of signal to the host in some kind of way that they had sufficient, um, that, that, that they didn't need to upregulate or there was no need to upregulate uh, these enzymes um, to sort of ass potentially assist with um, the breakdown of these, of, of these uh, carbohydrates. And so when we actually kind of look at a more sort of higher resolution uh, level, um, we do see that in general, um, we find that these uh, amylases and maltases and then other sort of myrosinases and glucosidases, uh, which we would typically ex uh, ex expect to be expressed primarily um, in the mid guts, we do start actually, which we do see here, we actually start seeing some of these same enzymes being expressed um, in the hind guts, which hadn't really been characterized um, prior to this. And so we, we found this to be kind of interesting because um, it is, it's in the hind gut where many of these taxa, the members of the bacteroidetes um, and the formicutes tend to be most abundant and are likely uh, contributing to the production of, um, of short chain fatty acids. Okay. So one, one question we had as a part of this work was, okay, so you know, many of those processes of breaking down carbohydrates are sort of downstream of various types of developmental um, signaling pathways, and how are they potentially responding um, as a result of these sort of perturbations in the gut microflora? And in general, what we found was that um, uh, 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 signaling pathways like uh, the J and K, DPP, and growth factor signaling pathways, we did find that they tended to be down-regulated in germ-free, but dramatically down-regulated uh, within our, um, our nonbiotic-treated uh, uh, insects. And this was really fascinating because, again, it showed that just returning any commensals in the microbial community doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily elicit normal development. And so it suggests that there's a particular um, core set or an important set of microbes required for development um, in uh, Paraplanate Americana. And while these bacteria that we used um, could be contributing to the breakdown of, of carbohydrates, uh, they may not alone be sufficient for eliciting normal development in their host. And so we're at, to, uh, I'm 40 minutes in and I, I sort of want to still have some time for questions and discussion. 
So I think I'm going to fast forward just a little bit here. Um, and basically just I want to, you know, sort of highlight that when we go even, you know, in, into some of the other signaling pathways, as far as looking at um, the sensing of, of, uh, of insulin and sensing, sensing of energy availability within um, our germ-free, our nautobiotic, um, as well as in our, um, compared to our wild type individuals, we, we also see um, down regulation of many of the genes involved in this as well. And so I'll just sort of draw your attention briefly to uh, some of the enzymes that are involved in the just sensing of insulin um, and how many of them are, uh, many of the, um, the isoforms are down-regulated uh, within our germ-free and in our, um, in our nautobiotic individuals uh, compared to um, wild types. So we think that um, all along the signal, you know, all across these signaling pathways that are involved in um, energy acquisition and energy sensing, um, that there are sort of problems in place, um, even if you maybe have microbes that are uh, contributing in a positive way to this, that they alone are not necessarily um, uh, uh, necessary for being able to um, allow for uh, um, driving or initiating or helping with normal development. Okay, um, and so this is just basically showing how in um, similar work that's done in say honeybees or within Drosophila, um, where you have actually a lot less complex microbial communities um, that the return of uh, of some of those taxa, or even in the case of Drosophila, one of those taxa is uh, sufficient for being able to recover near wild type um, levels of expression um, within these uh, insulin insulin uh, uh, signaling pathways. All right, so I don't really have time to go into talking about some of the IMD pathway work, but if people have questions about it, I'm happy to answer those questions. I'll show those slides, but I just wanted to. Um, leave enough time for us to uh, be able for me to take any questions. But I'll just finally say that we think that Paraplate Americana is a really nice model system. It's really cheap to maintain in your lab. Um, it's omnivorous and so amenable to a lot of different types of diets, including those from humans. It has a lot of gut bacteria that you can actually cultivate um, that have um, human conspecifics. Um, and there's also uh, uh, genomic resources available that really allows for doing really nice transcriptome um, work as well. And we have all these, many of these isolates and we're happy to sort of share those with people who are interested. And I'll just sort of put this up here to thank our funders, National Science Foundation, Ohio State, um, and then uh, a lot of the people who contributed to this work. Um, and we're also recruiting um, in our lab as well as in our department. So eob.osu.edu. Uh, and with that, I'll stop and take any questions. All right, awesome job, man. Um, so I got a lot of activity in the background here. Um, so I have, a, I have a question to start off with, and I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on um, I know in human uh, with these complex polysaccharides, um, I know that there's a lot of crosstalk between the different microbes in terms of breaking down those polysaccharides and they kind of team up. Um, so do, have you looked into that or, or do, do you see any of that kind of crosstalk in terms of certain species helping each other break down those, those complex carbons? Yeah, you know, um, the Martens lab um, has published some really beautiful work on that. And, um, and, that, and, and, and we haven't done those, those types of experiments yet we have the tools to be able to do that. Um, and we essentially, you know, are just trying to get enough hands in the lab to be able to do that. But um, we would be surprised if that isn't the case, given that cockroaches are feeding on pretty um, diverse types of, uh, of plant material and are encountering a wide variety of polysaccharides. So yeah, I would be really surprised if there isn't that type of crosstalk going on. Um, so I'm going to cruise around to Twitter and to, um, I guess I'm realizing now that the comment box is disabled on YouTube, so I need to fix that for future ones. Um, so if anybody has any questions, please uh, leave a Twitter comment at, at microseminar. Um, otherwise, um, so the other thing I'm curious about is do you have any 
insights into what might be controlling the um, the regulatory stuff with with insulin breakdown and um, what what might actually be causing the the changes you're seeing. Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, what's causing these changes? I mean, we we do think that the absence of the back of bacteria um, is so we think that bacteria are sensed certainly um, by uh, by cockroaches by their by their you know immune system, and I I guess I'll just bring it up here. Um, I mean, so part of the, the like the IMD pathway, for example. So you have IMD and TOL, which are part of the uh, innate immunity systems. So they can certainly, you know, sense bacteria um, within their uh, their digestive tract. And one of the things that we did see is that um, when we get rid of bacteria, so this is like our germ-free, um, we do see changes in the expression of genes that are, or gene products that are known to play a role in sensing of bacteria. So for example, this um, peptidoglycan recognition protein um, LB, which is um, key in sort of sensing peptidoglycan and plays a role in sort of uh, breaking it down. So it is a, an immu immunomodulator. Um, we do see differences in expression um, of various uh, PGRPLB uh, isoforms depending on the treatment, okay? So we think that since they are responding um, in terms of being able to sense the presence and absence of bacteria, and we also see it's not just simply presence and absence, but also the, the types of bacteria that are there. So for example, if we look between these two columns, we see that there's sort of different levels of downregulation of say these two isoforms, um, of this LB, depending on whether it's wild type or notobiotic. So we think that there is some uh, uh, discrete discriminatory uh, abilities of the innate immune system within paraplanate americana. So if it is able to sort of detect not only if bacteria are there or not, but also maybe who's there, then we think that that could then uh, play into whatever signaling that's involved in terms of like, how it will sort of manage its ability to access uh, various resources that are coming in uh, from the diet. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, that was good. Um, to, the, to the best of your abilities right now, it's, it's all good. Um, so the, the last thing I wanna ask is, uh, so how do you see um, interactions between these microbes actually kind of evolving over time? So what, what can you say about longer term kind of cockroach community evolution in terms of, you know, how the microbes have gotten together and, and how you might get these co-evolving interactions actually showing up for things like sugar, uh, you know, carbon breakdown. Because I know insects microbiomes are, are weird in a variety of ways um, in terms of, you know, John McCutcheon stuff um, and, and other ways. Um, so do you see parallels in terms of kind of the co-evolutionary things that might be happening in these cockroaches and other systems? Or um, do you think that might be something that kind of separates them apart versus some of these other insect systems that have shown up? Yeah, so... Um... You know what are the what are some of the potential uh, evolutionary paths that maybe traveled as a, as a result of uh, these long term interactions between gut bacteria and uh, the cockroach host? Well, one thing that we we have seen is that you know there's been a lot of really wonderful work within entomology in terms of building phylogenies um, within the Dictyoptera, and so Dictyoptera are cockroaches, termites, um, and like the mantids. And so when we just look at sort of cockroaches and termites, so termites are basically social cockroaches. They showed up a bit later. Um, the termites showed up a bit later than the cockroaches. And we do find that actually members of the Bacteroidetes and the Formicides are not only abundant within say termites, uh, but they're also um, in some ways, largely what's, what's still there. I mean, obviously you have within like the lower termites, for example. I mean, you certainly have um, spirochetes in there as well, and you have you know, other taxa that are playing really important roles. But we do know that uh, members of the Bacteroidetes are um, huge contributors um, to, the, uh, the, uh, to, to the breakdown of sort of the dietary um, uh, uh, termite diets. So in short, yeah, I would say that um, the members of the Bacteroidetes are sort of critical parts um, of the microbial communities within um, 
sort of cockroaches and termites in general. Um, and we think that, you know, some of the work that we're, we're trying to explore now as far as looking at sort of uh, mutation rates and some of these really abundant um, uh, members of the community um, that we might be able to use that as a way to look at how, say, you know, environmentally, uh, environmental residing uh, uh, members of the bacteroid DDs versus those that are sort of associated with uh, host in general. Um, do we see sort of changes in sort of evolutionary rates and how that might be suggestive of um, how these bacteria are uh, maintaining these relationships with their host? But we think that just given the diet, that's, 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 having a huge impact on what the uh, the microbial communities are and who sticks around and you know who potentially can be voted off the island um so we have a we have a twitter question now um so uh says that there are small but notable number of reports of invertebrates from natural environments which seem to have extremely low microbial densities on the order of 10 to 100 cells in the whole digestive system um this suggests that potentially the germ-free state is a natural state um, for some of these insects. So can you um, talk a little bit about how this might fit into the framework of your research and how it, it compares and informs our understanding of vertebrate systems? Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I, I think that um, the number of bacterial cells that are present at a, at a moment within an organism, you know, can be sort of informative about what role they may be playing um, in the host, um, and and, I, and and I'm actually not um, I, I don't know very much about those organisms, so um, I, I, yeah, I would need to look into that to, to get a better sense of it. But given that um, that that in some ways is that seems to be less common, um, the absence of bacteria present within organisms than uh, than the presence. Um, I think that it, it would be really interesting to look at those organisms and begin to maybe even look at um, what are the, some of the, um, you know, sort of bacterially antagonistic, antagonistic components that may be being produced by those, and then what's underlying that. So looking at the immune systems of those, um, are they particularly active? What are the habitats of those, of those organisms? You know, how long are they lived? I mean, this is one thing about cockroaches. I mean, they, they can live for up to two years. Um, and so as a part of living, you know, for a long period of time and living in, you know, some of the not nicest parts um, of the world um, or in our, in our own houses, in our own buildings, um, they are living in sort of microbially rich spaces. So, you know, trying to keep them all out is probably impossible, but developing a means to live with some of them um, is probably um, much more useful. And, and, I, and, I, and so I think that that's, that's what we see more commonly. And so, but I, I'd be really interested in learning more about those. Cool. I'm just gonna cruise around one more time, see if there's any more questions. Uh, doesn't look like it. So thanks very much, man. This, this is an awesome seminar. It's great to hear about all these diverse systems and especially these really cool systems that uh, uh, where there's diversity in terms of even within the insects and how things might might be different when the diet's changing those. Um, so thanks again. Um, I just want to remind everybody that uh, Zaki is is uh, recruiting. Um, so contact him by email. Um, you can find him on Twitter at, was it MGMT Worker? Is that the? It's, it's basically migrant worker um, without any vowels. <laughs> All right. So um, please feel free to contact him there or through email. Um, and again, thank you very much, man. This was, this was a great seminar. Hey, thank you very much, David. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the invitation. Cool. All right. So I'm going to, uh, let's see. We'll see if I can stop the streaming now. Um, <laughs> my computer is slowly breaking down too. So this is one of those things where I need to get a new computer. Um, yeah. So... <laughs> It's not letting me stop the stream yet, but basically what I'll do, so this will be on YouTube um, and then we'll just leave it up there. I'll, I'll trim it down so that it's uh, this discussion at the end is a little bit shorter. Um, but other than that, um, should be good to go. So, all right, we're going to end the stream um, and that should be good. So again, man, thank you.